in the time that he's been with us here. He's a graduate of the Brown Trail School of Preaching, was an excellent student when he was here. He endears himself to everyone that uh, uh, ever met him, and we love him uh, from the bottom of our hearts here at Brown Trail, and we appreciate his multi-talents that he uses so effectively in the upbuilding of the Lord's cause. Mark has a lovely family, his wife Michelle, and, and I believe it's five children. I never can get it straight whether it's four or five children, but they're all wonderful uh, children and a great, great Christian family, and we love him dearly, and you're going to love hearing him speak. And we're happy to have him kick off this lectureship, the 30th annual Fort Worth Bible Lectureship. Begins today in spite of the inclement weather. And we want to just press on and do the best we can uh, in spite of the slipping and sliding. Just be careful coming and going from the building. That's all we ask. But we're happy to have Mark speak on a very vital subject, uh, one that needs to, to be uh, uh, spoken on throughout the Brotherhood of Christ, and that is the Bible is God's Word. I have no doubt about that whatsoever. And all of us uh, who are Christian people believe that with all of our hearts and he's going to give us uh, m much insight into uh, how we can have a uh, great sense of confidence in the sacred scriptures as being from almighty god brother mark teske i hope you all appreciated that introduction uh, to get Max to say those kind words is going to cost me very dearly. I appreciate him so much, and I appreciate the opportunity to be before you this morning and to, and to kick off this great lectureship. On the outside, there appeared to be great reforms going on within the land of Judah. King Josiah did a wonderful job of tearing down the idols, cleansing the temple, rebuilding parts of it, celebrating the Passover like it hadn't been celebrated in centuries. He was also able to go into the northern kingdom and do away with some of the idolatry that they were dealing with. The man had great influence in his day. But even with great Josiah, that wonderful king, he couldn't reform the people's hearts. His reforms were short-lived. After his death, idolatry soon returned. And a few mere years later, the Jews would be carried off into Babylonian captivity because of their idolatry. That's the background into which Jeremiah, the great prophet, was introduced. You see, Jeremiah was, was selected by God even while he was in the womb. Chapter 1, verse 5 tells us, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. God knew Je Jeremiah was working even back then to bring about his purpose. One that would see more persecution than any other prophet. He was the only prophet that was forbidden to marry. We, were, we read in uh, chapter 16, verse 2. He was the son of a priest by the name of Hilkiah. Rather interesting, that name is the exact same name as the priest who found the book of the law that had been lost for so many years. The finding of the book of the law occurred a mere five years after Jeremiah started his work, leading some to the conclusion that Hilkiah, the one who found the book of the law, and Hilkiah, Jeremiah's father, were indeed the same person. A very real possibility. Rather ironic as well. Because Jeremiah spoke the word of the Lord. 
One of the things I'd like for us to think about as we, as we think about Jeremiah and, and speaking the word of the Lord is let's just fast forward for just a brief moment to the New Testament and look back at, the Jeremiah, at Jeremiah's writings from the New Testament perspective. You see, some of his prophecy was quoted by Jesus and by Paul. The Gospel writer Matthew confirmed Jeremiah as a prophet. And there are between 41 and 96 allusions to his writings in the New Testament documents. You see, the link between Jeremiah and the New Testament is very real. The two are inseparably linked. You can't take the New Testament and throw away Jeremiah. You can't take Jeremiah and throw away the New Testament. The two go hand in hand. There are some in the world who claim that, oh, the people in the churches of Christ, they don't believe in the Old Testament. On the contrary, I'm here declaring before you that if you don't believe in the Old Testament, if you don't believe in the inspired writings of Jeremiah, you have a hard time with the New Testament as well. The two of them come together. So Jeremiah started his ministry in the 13th year of Josiah's reign. Josiah was the last good king, and, and we're about to begin that downward spiral that would lead to the captivity. He started approximately 70 years after Isaiah, during the last 40 years of the southern kingdom, and the first 26 years of captivity. Contemporaries of Jeremiah's included Zephaniah, Nahum, Habakkuk, and during the captivity, Ezekiel and Daniel. This was a time that's one of the most, one of the best documented as far as prophetical writings go in the whole history of Judah. And the phrase that we hear continually, the word of the Lord, the word of the Lord, the word of the Lord. But you see, during that day, there was a lack of respect for God's word. There was a great lack of respect. We read in Jeremiah chapter 8, verse 9, The wise men are ashamed, they are dismayed and taken. Behold, they have rejected the word of the Lord. So what wisdom do they have? And I think that well summarizes the situation in which Jeremiah was, Jeremiah was working. A total lack of respect for the word. In the 36th chapter of Jeremiah, we have the story of Ch King Jehoiakim, who was being read the works of Jeremiah. He would read, have a small section read to him. He'd take a knife, cut it, and throw it into the fire. So that by the time the entire work was read... It had all been burned. That indeed is a lack of respect for God's word. In contrast, King Josiah, when the book of the law was found, the word of the Lord, he wept, mourned, and sprang into action. We see two totally different reactions to the word of the Lord. Let me ask you this question this morning. How do you respond to God's word? How do you respond to God's word? There's the way King Josiah did, accepting, weeping, and mourning, and a springing to action, or like King Zedekiah, uh, excuse me, King Jehoiakim, who cut it off and threw it in the fire. Which way do you respond to the teachings of the Lord? You see, when the commands are easy, something that we agree with, they can be very easy. But it's when the word of the Lord goes against our personal will. Where the rubber meets the road, then how do you respond? What effect does it have? Do you throw it away? Or do you embrace it? We see Jeremiah was very, was very persecuted 
by those around him. There was a conspiracy to verbally attack and discredit him, as we read in chapter 18, verse 18. He was beaten and imprisoned and then thrown into a cistern, we read in chapter 38. There was great persecution against these men who were delivering the word of the Lord. Let me read a small section for you from chapter 26, beginning in verse 20. Now there was also a man who prophesied in the name of the Lord, Urijah, the son of Shemaiah of kirjath Jerim, who prophesied against this city and against this land according to all the words of Jeremiah. Their language was consistent. And when Jehoiakim the king, with all his mighty men and all the princes, heard his words, the king sought him to put him to death. But when Urijah heard it, he was afraid and fled and went to Egypt. Then Jehoiakim the king sent men to Egypt, Elnathan, the son of Akbor, and other men who were went, went with him to Egypt. And they brought Urijah from Egypt and brought him to Jehoiakim the king, who killed him with the sword and cast his dead body into the graves of the common people. Nevertheless, the hand of Ahikam, the son of Shephan, was with Jeremiah, so that they should not give him into the hand of the people to put him to death. That's the environment in which he was working. Great persecution against him and against the other prophets. Why? For merely speaking the word of the Lord and carrying it out faithfully. The attacks against God mess but God's messengers were there and they remain today. Those who preach the word of the Lord are persecuted. Yes, we're even promised that persecution will occur. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12. We're also given hope and given comfort in that the prophets and their ability to overcome the persecution serves as an example for us today. James chapter 5, verse 10. Again, I ask you, how do you respond to the word of the Lord? When the gospel message is preached, how do you respond? Preachers, are you faithful to deliver that word? Even when the people don't want to hear it? For all of us, as we hear the word of the Lord, are we willing to accept it? Or do we lash out? at the messenger. How do we respond when the persecution is there? Luke chapter 6 verse 23 tells us, Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for indeed your reward is great in heaven. For in like manner their fathers did to the prophets. Those who speak the word of the Lord have been persecuted, are persecuted, and will be persecuted. But that shouldn't prohibit us from doing the work that's at hand. The word of the Lord. That phrase that's heard 281 times in the Bible. 127 times in the major prophets alone. A hundred and twenty-seven times. You know, they say the key to learning is repetition. Hearing it over and over and over again. And indeed, reading through the major prophets, we hear that over and over and over again. And I think that highlights to us the stubbornness of the people in Jeremiah's day. Hearing that refrain over and over again and they still rejected it. For the Christian, when we hear that phrase, the word of the Lord, we know that it's inspired. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. These things that were written before time were written for our learning Hebrews 15, uh, Romans 15, verse 4. These things are valuable for us today. The word of the Lord. 
referred to in Jeremiah 6, verse 16, by another phrase, the old paths. Seek the old paths. Go back to the way God described his plan in Scripture. Spend time there. You know, that's the restoration plea right there. Seek the old past. Go back to the Bible. That is where we get authority. That's what we must do. Brethren, don't be deceived. There are many attacks being waged against the word of the Lord even today. There are attacks against it. I'd like to spend just a little time looking at a few of those that maybe you'll be aware and none of these will cause you to stumble. One of the ways that people are attacking the word of the Lord today is through this idea that's called thought inspiration. It's the idea that the writers merely interpreted the thoughts that the Lord gave them and wrote them down in their own words. You may be sitting there saying, well, that difference sounds rather petty. But brethren, it's not petty. It's critical. We read in 2 Peter chapter 1, starting in verse 20, knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. This passage here in 2 Peter highlights to us the way Scripture was delivered. These men did not interpret the thoughts God gave to them. They wrote the words that God gave to them. What's the big difference? What's the big deal? Well, you see, when that idea of thought inspiration comes in, what happens inevitably after that is people begin to differentiate and say, well, God's thought was this. I know the words say that, but his thought was really this. And there's a difference in their thinking between God's will and what's been delivered to us in the Word. It's a way of excusing our not obeying the Word of the Lord. Tragically, even some who have tried to translate the Word of the Lord have given up on verbal inspiration and have gone with this idea of thought inspiration and carried it forward to a thought translation. I'm not going to tell you what the Lord said. I'm going to tell you what I think he meant instead of what he said. There's a big problem there. Because the men have gone beyond translating and have dug into interpreting. Another way that the word of the Lord has been attacked, some have claimed that much of the Old Testament isn't historical events that actually happened. These aren't real people, these aren't real events, but mere fables. Stories that were made up that, that teach a good lesson to you. Brethren, that shows a great disrespect for the word of the Lord. I know of no better place to go for evidence that that's not the case than the words of Jesus himself. You see, because the, the stories in the Old Testament that seem to come into contra, uh, conflict most often are some of the very ones that Jesus attested to, and we have documentation in Scripture for that. First off, the account of creation. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. There are many, even in our own brotherhood, who dismiss the, 
Bible's account of creation in favor of evolution. Day-age theories, there's theories all over the place. People trying to explain away the simple teaching of God's Word. But in the 19th chapter of Matthew, Jesus said, In the beginning, He made them male and female. Matthew 19, verse 4. In the beginning, not billions and billions of years later, but in the beginning. How about the story of Noah and the flood? Oh, that can't possibly be true, can it? A worldwide flood, a great big boat? Let's ask Jesus. Luke chapter 17, verses 26 and 27. He says, as in the days of Noah, real man, those people were real people who were destroyed in the flood. And he uses it to compare to his second coming. Those people had no clue, and that serves as a witness to you and I today. How about the story of Sodom and Gomorrah? God raining fire and brimstone down on these wicked cities. Lot and his family being rescued by two angels posing as men. Could that story possibly be true? Still in Luke chapter 17, verses 29 through 32. Jesus talks about those souls of those people who were destroyed when Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed. Real people. Again, he's backing up the words of the Lord. How about the story of Jonah and that great, the great fish? Luke chapter 11, verses 29 through 32. The story of Jonah. Real people. And those people in Nineveh who converted, who changed, repented of their sins, they will rise up in judgment upon this generation, Jesus said. Real people, and you're going to see them come judgment day. Attacks against God's word. Some people have, have claimed that the Bible is full of errors and contradictions. Critics throw that allegation out time and time again. Yet never, ever has a single one been proven. Not a one. Yet they don't stop making the claim. They still say time and time again, oh, the Bible's filled with errors. And when you dig into the details, every time the Bible rings true. What's the effect of these different attacks on Scripture? Well, if you allow one of them to remove your faith in Scripture, it takes away the control of the text. It takes away the control of the text. Is this the word of the Lord or is it not? You see, because if Jonah was not a real man, and those literal people in the literal city of Nineveh didn't literally repent at the literal preaching of Jonah, then Jesus didn't know what he was talking about, did he? He said that we're going to meet those people at the judgment day. We can't throw one out without affecting all the others. Brethren, I'm convinced 
the reason that there's so many people attacking God's word as they do is merely because they don't like the content of what's being taught. They don't like the words of the Lord. It's their version of doing what King Jehoiakim did by cutting it off and throwing it in the fire. Don't like the teaching? Criticize the messenger, even if it's the word of the Lord. You see, God's word is powerful. It's strong. It's effective. Jeremiah was told in verse 10 of the first chapter, he said, See, I have this day set you over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out, to pull down, to destroy and to throw down, to build and to plant. Jeremiah, you're receiving the word of the Lord because there's a job to be done. There's work to be done. And this, my friend, is your tool. Notice the things that were told to him that he was to do with this, to root out, to pull down, to destroy, to throw down. Negative things, but also to build and to plant. You see, the content of much of Jeremiah's message, the word of the Lord that came through him, much of it was negative. It was difficult for the people to hear, difficult for them to take in. But that's because their lives were not what they should be. So oftentimes the charges come that, oh, the preaching is so negative. And in reality, it's just the word of the Lord. The negative, negativity comes because our lives are not right. And at the same time, there were false prophets in his day saying, peace, peace, chapter 6, verse 14. There was no peace. Jeremiah was telling the truth, truly proclaiming the word of the Lord. The Hebrew writer tells us the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. You see, the word of the Lord has power. It's a tool that's made to mold lives. It's not something to put up on a bookshelf and leave it. It's something for us to take in, to digest, to make a part of us. You see, if we choose to apply it or not makes no difference on the power of the word. Isaiah records that God's word is not going to return to him void. Chapter 55, verse 11. It's going to do its job regardless of whether you and I accept it or reject it. His word will judge us in the last day. John 12, verse 48. The word is indeed powerful. Let's look just a moment at Jesus and his view of Scripture. He being the perfect Son of God, his view of Scripture should become our view of Scripture. He had the knowledge. He had the understanding. And if we mirror that, we'll have a proper knowledge and understanding ourselves. Five different occasions in his ministry, Jesus used the phrase, Have you not read? Have you not read? Read what? 
the Scriptures. Each and every time he followed that up, quoting Scripture. And you can hear the tone of indignation in the phrasing there. Haven't you read? You should have read. You should have understood. And you should have applied it. That's his expectation. There's power in that word. There is mighty power in that word. It's been said before that the best sermon in the world is the one that passes right over me and hits that person sitting behind me who really needed that one. Brethren, sadly, that's the the attitude too many have taken to the word of the Lord. Rather than spending time in self-examination, we spend our time in examination of others. Absolutely, we need to judge with righteous judgment. But brethren, Scripture also says we need to remove the plank from our own eye first. Then we can help our brother remove the speck from his eye. You who are spiritual, restore such a one. You see, men have come up with many excuses to avoid applying God's word in their lives. We can just briefly touch on these, and, and I urge you, get a copy of, the, of the, the book. There's a lot more in the book than you'll ever hear any of the speakers uh, talk about, and it's worded so much better when you have time to think about it. How do people avoid applying God's word? Well, one is, is through the use of postmodern thought. The idea, I'm okay, you're okay. There's no such thing as absolute truth. I have my truth, you have your truth. Doesn't matter if it contradicts each other, it's okay. Our truths are different. I don't have to conform to your truth, your interpretation, because that's different from my interpretation. Brethren, that's postmodernism. And it's a way that people use when they don't like the teaching of God's word to say, oh, well, that's just your truth, that's just your interpretation. Sadly, it's been said too often. When people read passages like Mark 16, verses 15 and 16, they'll read it and without any comment start arguing with the text. It's plain and clear. So simple a child can understand it. But again, that's rejecting the truth that's there. It's similar to what we read in the book of Judges. In that day, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Or as Jesus said, the man who built his house upon the sand. Those were the people who heard his word and didn't apply it in their lives. Building your house upon the rock is those who hear the word and do it. If you're explaining away the teachings of God's word, your house is built on the sand. Make no mistake about it. James says, be doers of the word and not hearers only. Some have claimed that you don't need biblical authority. That's their way of getting around scripture. Oh, you don't have to have biblical authority. I can apply it however I want. I can do whatever I want. 
it doesn't really matter. It feels good to me. I feel this is right. But God's word is clear. Colossians 3.17 Whatever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. We must have authority for all that we do. Period. End of discussion. We must have authority. Others have attacked God's word by trying to change who it applies to. And I'll be honest with you, this is one of the most bizarre arguments I have ever heard. Some people have said, okay, the the New Testament doesn't apply to non-Christians. Oh? If I'm not under the Old Covenant, and I'm not under the New Covenant, I have no covenant. I have no law. If I have no law, I can't sin. So why would I be a fool, try and become a Christian, put myself under a law, and create the potential of sin if I couldn't sin before? That argument is ridiculous. Utterly ridiculous. Others have gone and and tried to say that Jesus' teachings weren't part of the New Covenant. That was Old Covenant. Totally neglecting the fact that the old was about to come to an end. It's nailed to the cross, Colossians 2.14. And that the documentation of that was not written until years after his death. So the books would have been obsolete before they were even written. Patently false doctrine. But each time people use these arguments, it very soon becomes Plain and clear, the reason is they don't like some of Jesus' teachings. And so they find excuses to try and deflect the word of the Lord. Jeremiah faced similar things in his day. But as in his day, judgment was coming in the form of the Babylonian army. And those people were going to be carried away into captivity. Make no mistake about it. Captivity was coming. They were going to see their judgment. You and I will see our judgment as well. It may not be here and now. It may be at that judgment bar. But judged we will be. And we will give an account. I'd like to leave you with the thoughts that the Apostle Paul gave to the brethren in Rome when he said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. He identified that source of power, the good news, the word of the Lord, the gospel message. Brethren, we should do everything we can, everything within our being to embrace the word of the Lord and respect it for what it really is. Thank you very much.